To get the latest voting rights and democracy news, subscribe to Democracy Docket's free newsletters. Click in the link in the upper right-hand corner to subscribe now. When most people think about discrimination in voting, they think about minority voters being discriminated against. They think about the general public facing inconveniences in voting unnecessarily because legislators want to make it harder to, for example, vote by mail. But the most recent constitutional amendment dealing with the question of discrimination in voting was aimed at protecting a specific class of voters, and those are young voters. The 26th Amendment to the Constitution was added in the 1970s specifically to protect young voters from age discrimination in voting. People think of the 26th Amendment as the provision that lowered the voting age to 18 years of age, but what it actually did was much more powerful. It said that no one can be ha can have their rights to vote abridged or denied on account of age if they are over 18 years of age. So Paige, this topic of youth voting is one that is very much in the news because it it has become the latest way that Republicans can seek to gain an upper hand in the outcome of elections. And I have to laugh because just a few days ago, um, Scott Walker, of all people, the failed uh, disgraced governor of Wisconsin, tweeted that, uh, that young voters were behind the, quote, stinging loss for conservatives in Wisconsin which is true, but he claims that it was due to years of liberal indoctrination uh, and that uh, he's going to try to help uh, turn this around. Paige, I think if there was ever a person who was not meant to be the leader of any effort to turn around youth voting, it would be Scott Walker. And you have to wonder why Scott Walker, when I saw these tweets, I was taken aback. The way that a former official, a, formal govern a former governor would say that it's a bad thing, that there was a huge youth turnout in this, you know, off year state Supreme Court race that launched Janet Protasiewicz to victory. You have to remember that when Scott Walker ran for a third term to be Wisconsin governor, he lost in 2018 to Tony Evers, largely in part to youth voters. He lost that election by about 30,000 votes. And at the time, according to Tufts University, uh, student voters, college student voters, made up almost 7% of the state's eligible voting age population, which amounts to over 340,000 voters. And when you look at the breakdown of counties, of County Scott Walker one or Tony Evers one, in counties where there was a college campus, Evers usually handedly took it and won by a huge majority. So Scott Walker hates student voters because they're the reason why he lost in 2018. Right. And every time you hear Republicans talk about young voters, college voters, even high school uh, voters, non-college young voters, uh, they talk in derisive terms and they are constantly engaged in efforts to prevent this population from voting. And Paige, this has a long history. You know, you go back uh, to the reason why we have the 26th Amendment was because states were trying to go out of their way to fence out of the political process the, uh, the youngest cohort of voters. Mark, the term youth voter, I think, can seem really broad and kind of loosey-goosey when you're trying it to think about it. gets broader as you get older. Let me just tell you this. This much I can tell you. You know, when I was 30, it felt much younger than now that I'm 54. Youth voting seems much older. Well, let's clarify by what we mean when we say youth voters. Typically, when people, organizations, politicians are talking about youth voters, it's voters under the age of 30, so 18 to 30. But there's a special emphasis on student voters who tend to be 18 to 22 years old. But it's important to remember, not all young voters are student voters. Not all student voters are young voters. But attacks on young voters tend to go hand in hand with attacks on student voters, just because logistically, if you're targeting the way student voters vote, you can target thousands, if not tens of thousands of potential voters at one time, because you're talking about a college campus. 
it's usually densely populated with 18 to 22 year olds. There may not always be transportation uh, easily accessible on and off that campus. You could have a lot of out of state students. So college campuses just become a very easy and convenient way to either help young people reach the ballot box or if you're a Republican and you want to suppress those voters because they do tend to vote for Democrats, not Republicans, you have them all in one spot and you can cut off access points in and around the campus to make sure that they can't cast their ballot. Yeah, there are a couple of other things that make them easy to target for state legislatures. Uh, the first is that they're inexperienced voters. You know, if you think about it, most young voters are either first time voters or at most second time voters, uh, particularly ones who are away from home at college campuses are navigating a whole host of changes in their lives uh, uh, that they are trying to figure out. So voting is one additional logistical issue that college students face. And so that period of uncertainty in their lives, coupled with the facts that they don't have established patterns of voting, like older voters oftentimes do, can make them easier uh, to uh, discriminate against without the students necessarily knowing that they're being discriminated against. The other thing, of course, is that student voters in particular are highly mobile, right? They are in a location oftentimes for four years of their lives, sometimes a little more, sometimes less. Um, and so it's hard for them to establish that they are being discriminated against because they are entered a new environment. They, ha they, they think that what is happening is the normal status quo, even though it may be a recent or intentional act at um, discriminating against them. Paige, I do have one clarification that I want to ask you. If I'm young at heart, can I be a young voter? Anyone can be a young voter if they want to, but anyone can advocate for young voters as well. Yeah, anyone can advocate for young voters, especially because I think as a young voter myself, as someone who falls into this category and got started in voting rights on my college campus because it was hard to vote as a college student, there tends to be a bit of uh, apathy from older, from more established voters, I should say. Uh, who tend to think that, you know, the issues college students face when it comes to voting or young people face when it comes to voting is side effects of immaturity, right? Mark, like what you said, they're not experienced voters. They don't have established patterns yet. And they're like, well, they're, they're college students. Why should they even vote at their campus address? They're, they're not even engaged in local politics yet. They don't know anything about the quote unquote real world, um, which is, you know, some of y'all listening may be like, who would ever say that? Those are the Twitter replies we get all the time anytime we tweet about voter suppression laws targeting young voters or lawsuits trying to advocate for young voters. So, Mike, let's clear it up for everyone. Student voters who move to attend school are allowed to register to vote and cast a ballot using their campus address. And this isn't a rule that just came out of nowhere. It is a U.S. Supreme Court case. Sim v. United States, where, the SCOTUS, where SCOTUS ruled that college students can use their campus addresses as residencies for the purpose of voting. Yeah. And, you know, when I hear these arguments, whether it's on Twitter or to a surprising degree page, legislatures are very honest sometimes. You know, sometimes they, they really just speak the quiet part out loud when it comes to discriminating against young voters. Um, in a way that they would be hesitant to do if discriminating when discriminating against other other kinds of voters. Uh, but when I hear this, I, I'm sort of left with kind of two reactions. The first is we have moved in this country away from the notion that certain categories of people have more stake in democracy than others, right? That was the original rationale for why, for example, you had to own property in order to vote. Right. So this whole notion that some people have greater stakes in the community than others, I think, is actually a dangerous proxy for broader notions of limiting voting and voting rights. But the second page is whether you think it's good policy or bad policy, it's in the Constitution. Like it's literally an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So all of these conservatives who are constantly saying, but the Second Amendment, but the First Amendment, but this, but that in the Constitution. Well, I got news for you. 
The 26th Amendment is explicitly clear in protecting young voters. It was passed specifically to protect young voters. The legislative history of it could not be clearer. The text could not be clearer. So if you don't agree with it, then take it up by trying to repeal it. You know, we repealed prohibition. Uh, if people want to take on the, the, the youth voting as ill guided as I think it would be, their complaint is not with people like you and others who have advocated for youth voting. Their complaint is with the Constitution itself. Mark, I think it's also really interesting the way that people say that students or young voters aren't necessarily a part of a community because they're not, quote unquote, established enough. But at the same time, those same officials, politicians, local leaders are more than happy to count students in the census at their campus addresses and as part of their communities when they're asking the federal government for representation in Congress and federal funding. Students who live on college campuses are counted in the census as residents of that college campus. Now, individual students will change every year, but a student population as a whole is pretty constant from decade to decade. It tends to grow, not shrink. So officials are happy to have students as local residents when it comes to census, to, when it comes to census counting, even if they then turn around and say, you shouldn't vote here, you're not a part of our community. Yeah, again, you know, their gripe here is with the constitution, you know. These students have a right to vote. Uh, and by the way, Paige, it's, it's, uh, it's not like those students don't then face obstacles if they tried to vote where they, were, where they were born and raised, right? We've seen lots of laws like Texas, for example, that makes it hard for students who move out of Texas but want to continue to vote in Texas, makes it hard for them to vote. You know, even a state like Minnesota, which, you know, has has improved its voting laws over time, still requires a Minnesota witness to sign your absentee ballot. Well, if you're a student out of town at a school outside of Minnesota, that's no easy trick. So so states, you know, are not exactly um, uh, serving young voters regardless of where they want to vote. And that is something we need to see change. Right. I'm from Texas. We talked about it. I went to school in New York. It was a pain every election to get an absentee ballot from the state of Texas. I didn't vote in the 2016 primary or I didn't vote in the 2020 primary because Texas didn't send me my ballot on time. It, right. it didn't get to New York on time. I had friends from Minnesota. We had to find them a notary in New York City because they couldn't find another Minnesota voter to sign off as their witness on their ballots. Right. So overall, if you look at all of the statistics about voting, whether it is who wait in, waits in long lines to vote, who has their absentee ballots rejected. Paige, we've, we've talked on previous episodes about these, these um, wet ink signature laws that states like Texas, like Florida, Georgia have. These are just transparent efforts to prevent young voters from being able to register and vote. So it's an epidemic in this country. It is one that really deserves more attention than it gets, more outrage than it garners. And Paige, we're seeing now state after state after state take even more extreme, step, extreme steps to target youth voters. Yeah, so let's get into it, Mark. One of the most recent states to pass a law targeted directly at students was Idaho. They passed a law that eliminates the use of student ID cards to vote. And what you should know about Idaho is that between 2018 and 2022, registration jumped over 66% among voters aged 18 to 19 years old, which was the highest growth in the nation. Yeah, and they're, and Paige, they're doing this for one reason and one reason only, because they don't want young voters voting. You know, I, in some ways, uh, credit to Idaho for for not trying to hide their animus towards young voters. You know, they could have they could have put this provision in a bill that did a whole bunch of things, and then we'd be ferreting this out. No, they decided they were going to target young voters directly. And Paige, one of the comments I keep getting from people on social media and elsewhere is there is they say, well. 
unlike other forms of ID, your student ID doesn't have your address. Paige, what is another form of ID that all of these states allow that don't have your address? Every state accepts a U.S. passport for voting, and that doesn't... Your passport doesn't say where you live. It says where you were born. And so all of these efforts by Republicans to say we can't use student IDs, but we can use passports because they are providing more information. They actually provide less information. My passport just says I was born in New York. It doesn't tell the person in Virginia where I live anything about any connection to the great Commonwealth of Virginia. It just tells me that I'm from New York, uh, where I was where I was born from New York. So we need to put the lie to what these states are saying. And what Idaho is doing is just aimed at discriminating against students because of that increase in voting, and they don't want voter, voter young voters participating in their elections, and so they want to make it harder. And to give the scope of states that accept photo I that accept student IDs, there are 17 states that generally require a form of photo ID to vote. Uh, Idaho is joining Texas, North Dakota, Ohio, South Carolina, and Tennessee as states that don't accept any form of student IDs to vote. Arizona and Wisconsin have strict rules on student IDs that some colleges and universities struggle to meet. With some Wisconsin schools have done it. Again, there is a huge youth voter turnout in Wisconsin. That's why Scott Walker hates them. Paige, just for full disclosure, my law firm is suing Idaho right now uh, over this law in federal court. It's March for Our Lives of Idaho versus McRain. And you can read all about that case uh, on the Democracy Docket website. Initially, there's a state level lawsuit over the same law. It is Babe Vote v. McGrain. It is also on the Democracy Docket website, and we'll keep you updated on both cases. So, Mike, with this new law, Idaho is joining a handful of other states that is banning student ID as an acceptable form of ID to vote. One of another state that recently made this change is Ohio, another state with a very large student population that could have immense power in local elections. This year, they also passed a new law that does a whole host of things to make it harder to vote. But one of the provisions was eliminating student ID cards as an acceptable form of ID. Yeah, of course they did. And, you know, and then what happens is Idaho passes its law and we say it joins Texas and four other states. And one of those states is Ohio. So it's part of a race to the bottom that Republican legislatures engage in, where each of them justifies their restrictions on voting by pointing to the fact how there are other states that engage in voter restrictions. And Ohio's law is is shameful. I mean, it's shameful in so many respects, and we've talked about it. But their attack on student voting is uh, is predictable, because wherever you find Republican legislatures now passing new laws, uh, uh, that are restricting voting rights, you typically find them doing something uh, aimed at students. Look, Paige, at what's happening in Texas and Florida. Right. In Texas, we're seeing legislation proposed by a state representative who dis whose district includes a college campus with over like 30,000 students on it. She's proposed legislation to ban polling places both at institutes of higher education and at K through 12 schools. Just think about that for a second, everyone. Imagine first pa introducing a law that says you can't have college polling places at all. Okay, how bad and inconvenient and disenfranchising that would be. But then just to add crazy to nuttiness, you then say, oh, and by the way, you can't cite polling locations in LA in any elementary or high school. Paige, where are these polling places supposed to be? I don't know. When I voted in person in Texas, I voted at an elementary school. I remember when I was in elementary school, my parents came to my school to vote. And when your parents came, the office would call you up and you could hang out with your parents while they cast their ballot and then go back to class. But K through 12 schools, public schools in Texas are a huge source of polling locations because they're conveniently located in neighborhoods across the across the state. Everyone knows where they are, right? You go to the local elementary school. 
and they have, you know, big multi-purpose rooms, gyms where you can set up all the polling equipment. Yeah. Well, Texas is the, the nation's leader in creative voter suppression. And that is a terrible distinction for them. Uh, they have passed previous laws that target young voters. Uh, this is a state that has uh, no no excuse absentee voting unless you are elderly. Uh, so, which they also tried to do away with this year. A representative <laughs> which, introduced a bill to get a, to get rid of that. Yeah, um, they passed SB eleven eleven, which targeted young voters and other uh, uh, voters who are more mobile. So, we could go on and on about Texas. But what about Florida? Florida, another another state, another state having its time in the spotlight when it comes to to young people and education and schools. But there was a bill recently introduced in Florida, HB 7050, which says that each applicant who registers for the first time in the state and who the department has verified doesn't have ID on file is required to vote in person for the first time that a person votes in the state. Yeah, this is just a way to prevent first time voters who are oftentimes young voters from being able to vote by mail. It's just basically that simple. They're just depriving young voters the ability to vote by mail because they know that young voters in Florida rely on vote by mail. Now, remember, Paige, a few years ago, um, my team and I sued Florida because they tried to ban early voting centers on college campuses. They passed this law that said, actually, first they passed a rule, uh, uh, then a law that said that you could put a early vote center on in any public building except on a college campus. I mean, Paige, what's up with that? So we sued, we won, uh, eventually that w was rolled back. But Florida has tried to restrict college uh, and young voting before, and this is just the latest gambit to do so. I have said before that if um, uh, if uh, this new law, HB 750, uh, is enacted, which I suspect it will since DeSantis controls the legislature, uh, then Florida will be sued. Uh, someone recently tweet, wrote that uh, I indicated that Florida may be sued, and I responded, I didn't say they may be sued, I said they will be sued. So uh, that's what's going on in Florida. And people may say, how do you know that this law will target young voters, disenfranchise young voters? It's very similar to a Tennessee provision that requires first-time voters who register online or via mail to vote in person for the first time before they're allowed to vote by mail. So if you turn 18 while you're in high school or you send off a voter registration application and then you move for school or move for work and you still want to vote at home, you're, you're out of luck if, unless you voted in person before. Yeah, and Tennessee is, you know, the, 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 the terrible assault on democracy we have seen in the last few days and weeks in Tennessee, which is not just the wrongful expulsion of two black legislators, but also what we've seen um, done in the, uh, to the city of Nashville, the threats that have been made to show, uh, by the state legislature against Shelby County. These, these attacks on democracy don't stand by themselves. Right. The a legislature that is willing to assault democracy in that way, you have to look at the roots. And Tennessee has been has been restricting the ability of full participation in their elections. They've been targeting young voters. And and, and this is all part of a common mentality, a common approach that that legislature has a disdain for the voters and for voting rights and for democracy. So don't think that these things just crop up out of the thin air. It's all part of a pattern that we have to uh, we have to denounce and we have to expose. Mark, there's one more state I want to talk about because it's perhaps the state where it's most evident that Republicans have such a disdain for young voters simply because they tend to not vote for Republicans. Young voters tend to vote democratically. They tend to vote blue no matter where you are in the country as a whole college students do tend to vote more liberally than older counterparts. And no state exemplifies the contempt that Republicans have for that more than New Hampshire. Yeah. I, I, you know, a little known fact, in New Hampshire, 
Eleven percent of the population is made up of college students, and about 70 percent of them are out of state. So that is a huge percentage of the eligible voting population. Highest uh, eligible, uh, highest percentage of college students for a voting um, age population in the country. And though New Hampshire has tended to trend bluer in recent elections, it is still a very, very competitive state. You still have had in recent history, Republican senators, uh, there's a Republican controlled legislature, a Republican governor, and the tipping point for that state is always young voters. So there's no state that where the Republicans have had more contempt and more commitment to disenfranchise young voters than in uh, New Hampshire. And my law firm, in full disclosure, has brought a series of lawsuits now over the last few years, uh, have won some in the past, still litigating others, uh, uh, because this is so important to full participation um, in New Hampshire. Uh, you can find all of those cases if you visit the case page uh, for New Hampshire on the Democracy Docket website. Mark, in New Hampshire, the state Supreme Court the state Supreme Court struck down a law that had overly strict residency requirements for voter registration, obviously a target at young voters, at low income voters, more transient voters. New Hampshire Republicans have also tried to enact bills that change residency restrictions, change ID requirements, limit election day registration. But I think one of the most blatant attempts to disenfranchise student voters was in 2021 when New Hampshire Republicans tried to pass a bill that would require college students to qualify for in-state tuition in order to vote in New Hampshire. Yeah, it's shameful. It's just shameful all around the country what Republicans are doing. It's shameful that they are targeting voters who are eligible and have every right to participate because of a specific constitutional amendment. And it's also really short-sighted politics for them because, of course, you know, young voters become older voters. And one of the things we know is that how people vote in their 20s tends to define how they vote for the rest of their lives. So they are alienating for short-term gain a big chunk of the electorate. But I, I also don't want to let off the hook the colleges and the universities. You know, colleges and universities define themselves by the relationship with the, with the towns and cities in which they're located. You know, in most places where there is a college and university, they are the largest, if not, if not the largest, one of the largest employers. They are oftentimes among the largest landowners. They are often in time, uh, times a key economic driver for an area or even for an entire region. And so university presidents and college administrators have a lot at stake in their relationship with the towns and the cities and the villages surrounding them. Everything from, you know, their engagement in the community as tutors, providing access to libraries, cultural events, what their policies are for opening their campuses, all of those things are part of their relationships. And so colleges and universities need to define their relationship with their local communities by how their students are treated as voters. It's not enough that the local town and university cooperate with traffic control for athletic events. They need to cooperate with the placement of polling locations. It's not enough that the towns uh, and states uh, are are cooperating in taking pride in those uh, those uh, universities and the dollars that they that they draw. They need to similarly take pride in the rate of voting and the rate of civic engagement. And as you said, Paige, they can't just do everything they can to turn out people to make sure they're counted in the census. They need to make sure that they are doing everything they can to turn out those students to participate in their elections, because those universities are only going to be as strong as their students and their alumni. And if those students and alumni reflect back that the colleges and universities stood by while, while uh, legislatures were disenfranchising them, then shame on them.
and it will create an unhappy relationship with their young alumni. So Paige, that is all the time we have for today. Uh, you can find all of the cases and court filings and articles we mentioned in today's episode linked in the description of this episode. Thanks for listening to Defending Democracy. If you enjoyed today's episode, leave us a review. To find out more and stay up to date on the latest voting rights and election news, visit democracydocket.com. And please subscribe to our free daily and weekly newsletters. We'll see you next time. Today's episode was produced by Paige Moskowitz, Alexa Rothenberg, and Sophie Feldman. It was edited by Paige Moskowitz, Defending Democracy is a production of Democracy Docket, LLC.